Welcome to HealthCast, the heartbeat of health IT. I'm your host, Sarah Seibert. Today, we're joined by Dr. Kevin Fu, Acting Director of Medical Device Cybersecurity at the Food and Drug Administration Center for Devices and Radiological Health. We'll dive into how organizations should improve medical device cybersecurity, how his agency is creating guidance and playbooks to outline best practices, and how FDA is aligning with President Biden's recent executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. Medical devices are increasingly connected to the internet, hospital networks, and other medical devices to provide features that improve healthcare and increase the ability of healthcare providers to treat patients. These same features also increase potential cybersecurity risks. Medical devices, like other computer systems, can be vulnerable to security breaches, potentially impacting the safety and effectiveness of the device. I'll hand it off to Dr. Fu, who will explain how medical devices are uniquely positioned in the cybersecurity landscape and face distinctive security threats and vulnerabilities compared to other IT systems. Well, so in my work in, in computer security, it's, it's been on uh, quite a few different marketplaces, not just medical. Uh, one of the unique security challenges, however, to medical devices is the need for extremely high availability. Because a medical device that is not available to deliver patient care, uh, that is neither safe nor effective. And one of the things we learned this year, actually in April of 2021, was that ransomware can actually have uh, impact on not just the health record systems of hospitals, but the medical devices themselves, the core functionality of the therapies and diagnostics. And in particular, uh, ransomware remediation approaches led to a manufacturer's cloud being taken off the internet, causing all the uh, radiation therapy devices that depended on that cloud to no longer be available for several weeks. So I would say availability and the, the very extreme need for high availability is, is fairly unique to medical devices because of the safety challenges. Dr. Fu will go on to outline two primary challenges with securing medical devices, the lack of appropriate and proactive security checks, and what Fu calls the legacy device problem. Because the threat landscape is constantly evolving, medical devices have to be continually improved to combat modern vulnerabilities and cybersecurity attacks. Some of the specific challenges with securing medical devices are primarily where, where they're self-inflicted wounds. Uh, that's because the biggest threat to medical device security today is the lack of refutable scientific threat modeling. What do I mean by that? Uh, the, it's very difficult to secure a medical device until the design has appropriate security engineering, but you can't design appropriate security engineering until you have appropriate security requirements. And so the threat modeling is the cybersecurity equivalent to what the safety community might call hazard analysis. And uh, it's so important that actually uh, FDA recently announced a new playbook for medical device threat modeling. Uh, we sponsored the uh, MDIC and MITRE uh, to create this playbook to help manufacturers cope with how do you create a very meaningful uh, threat model for a medical device how do you characterize these types of threats in a predictable way as opposed to sort of a checkboxy way uh, so that you can defend not only against known vulnerabilities, but unknown vulnerabilities. And that's the real power, in my view, of threat models is that you can actually get out in front of these problems and defend against vulnerabilities you haven't even seen yet if you have a very meaningful threat model. So uh, that would be, in, in my view, the number one challenge associated with securing medical device. A second big challenge is the uh, legacy device problem. And, and anyone uh, working in, in a hospital uh, with medical devices knows about this problem. Uh, medical devices will uh, stick around for, for quite a while. And uh, the software, uh, strangely enough, tends to uh, wear out faster than the mechanics of medical devices today. And that's because the environment is changing rather quickly. Uh, in particular, the threat environment changes quickly. So a radiation therapy uh, machine that was designed uh, 10 or 20 years ago likely did not predict the risks of ransomware. Uh, and so there are devices uh, that we call legacy. A legacy device is one that is not only insecure today, 
but is fundamentally unsecurable against modern cybersecurity threats. Usually that's because there is some third-party software on the inside that is no longer uh, providing patches because it's uh, so old. Uh, sometimes it can be proprietary software uh, with other dependencies that just make it uh, infeasible for a manufacturer to uh, protect uh, against modern cybersecurity threats. So these legacy devices pose a particularly challenging problem, uh, and it's an active area of discussion in groups like the Health Sector Coordinating Council and the International Medical Device Regulators Forum uh, to try to figure out how do we reduce this problem of legacy. And uh, it's, it's quite challenging. It's also a, a people, a human problem, uh, because it involves a negotiation and understanding between the purchasers uh, at healthcare delivery organizations and the sellers at medical device manufacturers, understanding when different responsibilities shift from one party to another and where the costs lie. And so it's, it's a very challenging problem, but certainly uh, a device that is unpatchable uh, against a modern threat, uh, it would be very difficult to keep uh, safe and effective uh, the compensating controls of firewalls can only go so far. So legacy devices and threat modeling are, to me are the, the two biggest challenges right now uh, where we can make uh, quite a positive impact from an engineering perspective. To strengthen the cybersecurity and safety of medical devices, FDA is honing in on threat modeling, which is a structured process with four primary objectives identify security requirements, pinpoint security threats and potential vulnerabilities, quantify threat and vulnerability criticality, and prioritize remediation methods. As Dr. Fu mentioned earlier, FDA collaborated with its academic and industry partners to develop the Playbook for Threat Modeling Medical Devices, which provides a foundation that can inform an organization's threat modeling practices. It's intended to serve as a resource for developing or evolving a threat modeling practice. Dr. Fu will dive into how this playbook could improve security practices across the medical field. Starting on the threat modeling, let me just give an example of uh, we sort of anonymizing uh, uh, FDA submissions. We created sort of a dossier of typical incorrect threat models. And it's, uh, I think, a teachable moment to show sort of the difference between uh, a poor threat model and a meaningful threat model. So an example of a poor threat model, so please don't ever do this, would be uh, something like writing in a 510k uh, submission or a PMA, writing something such as, oh, our medical device has never been attacked, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, that is about as far as you can possibly get from a meaningful threat model, because it is, it is neither refutable nor science, it's strictly opinion. And uh, that's simply not a threat model. Uh, it's also wrong. Uh, because devices that have not been attacked are actually much more likely to be attacked in the future because that's the calculus of how adversaries work. And these are no longer kids in hoodies in their parents' basements. These are organized criminals with help desks and tech support to get ransomware uh, paid. Uh, these are nation states with economic motives uh, to cause harm. So it's, it's simply not prudent to say we've never been attacked. You, you do need to have uh, an appropriate threat model in my view. One of the more subtle examples of an incorrect threat model is saying something to the effect of, oh, our medical device just needs to be put on a secure hospital network in order to be secure. And at first glance, this might sound reasonable. But then to anyone who is an expert in uh, networking will suddenly realize, well, wait a minute, networks were never designed to be secure in the first place. It's always the responsibility of the endpoints to protect systems. And so one quickly learns that a VPN or a firewall, they can be helpful at reducing risk, but they're not a panacea. And there's no such thing as a secure hospital network. So in my view, a medical device needs to remain safe and effective, even if an adversary controls that network. And I know it's possible because I've done it before. Uh, I know it's possible because we teach young engineers how to do this in the university to build meaningful threat models to get out in front. And so an example of a threat model that does work in my view and is very common in, in secure devices 
would be to start with assume the adversary can control the network with the ability to alter, drop, and replay internet packets. And suddenly the designers will realize that they can't take certain shortcuts. And the beauty of this threat model is that it not only protects against known problems today with known vulnerabilities, but it also protects against future vulnerabilities. For instance, uh, if a, a new buffer overflow uh, comes out in a firewall, then your product uh, is likely to remain safe and effective even if that firewall fails or if something sneaks through because your threat model didn't depend upon the security of the network. And uh, I, I, let me just say, there are thousands of vulnerabilities in firewalls. And so firewalls uh, are, are really sort of Swiss cheese in my view and are helpful, uh, but are, are definitely not a, a panacea for security. So um, uh, there's, there's a few tips about uh, threat modeling. So I'd be glad to go into some of the, the human aspects as well. Fu explains that when organizations are securing systems and devices, it's also essential to focus on the human aspect of security. He notes that there needs to be a common ground between manufacturers and healthcare delivery organizations to build security into devices throughout the entire life cycle. I'll turn it over to Fu, who will dive deeper into this challenge and the potential solutions. This is an ongoing discussion, so uh, I would say it's, it's being solved, but I would say it's far from being completely solved. The uh, Again, the problem with legacy devices is that they're not only insecure, but they're unsecurable. Think about a radiation emitting device running on Windows XP uh, that would be instantly susceptible to the last 20 years of run-of-the-mill malware that sneaks past a firewall. So um, that's some, some pretty uh, sort of insecure software. So again, a big challenge from a human perspective is finding the common ground between the manufacturers and the healthcare delivery organizations to define responsibilities for patching software in the autumn years of a medical device product uh, life cycle. I sometimes like to think of uh, legacy medical devices as potholes, uh, and we would have a lot more unpatchable highways and crumbling bridges if we viewed legacy medical devices this way. Um, so it, it's very challenging, and I would say, one of the biggest challenges is how to have the healthcare delivery organizations and manufacturers come to agreement on when certain levels of support are, are no longer given, when a manufacturer may uh, reduce the type of support it's doing. Now, let me be clear, manufacturers are responsible for keeping medical devices safe and effective, uh, but there are, of, of course, economic issues at play. It's uh, very difficult for uh, a hospital to try to patch an unpatchable system. They might try to put in compensating controls, uh, such as uh, extreme lockdowns of networks to the point where the medical device is no longer very useful. And uh, th this is just one of the biggest challenges. How, uh, what responsibilities uh, shift between these two parties? When, what triggers it, and who pays for it? And um, a lot of these problems uh, are being discussed today. And again, I say it's a, it's a human issue uh, underway in, in many of the uh, groups who create standards on, on legacy and, and, and similar devices. In May 2021, President Biden released his executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity to bolster public and private efforts to help identify, protect against, detect, and respond to increasingly sophisticated malicious cyber attacks. The EO calls for specific actions to modernize cybersecurity in the federal government and sets a goal for more effective and agile federal government responses. Dr. Fu will explain that FDA is well positioned to meet the requirements outlined in the EO and is focusing on Software Bill of Materials, or SBOMs, to improve medical device cybersecurity. When the president released that executive order in May of 2021, uh, we were pleasantly surprised to find that our strategic directions mapped uh, almost one for one uh, with his executive order. So I would say FDA's approach is already in line, at least the approach that we're taking uh, internally is already in line with that executive order to improve the nation's cybersecurity. And in particular, there are two elements that I think resonate particularly uh, well, and that is uh, software bill of materials, also known as SBOMs, uh, and a cyber 
Cyber Security Safety Review Board are key elements of that executive order. And uh, you can see from FDA's messaging over the past several years that SBOMs are a crucial, crucial, crucial part of uh, safety and effectiveness. Uh, uh, SBOMs, from a layperson perspective, you can think of as a ingredient list of the third-party software inside a medical device so that uh, you can better understand the risks that you're inheriting from these third parties. Uh, and uh, the executive order is pretty clear that uh, anyone who wants to sell a medical device or, or any product uh, to the federal government, the executive order makes it clear that SBOMs are expected if you wish to make a sale with the U.S. government. And so that executive order uh, is effectively a, a way for the government to influence the marketplace. Uh, and uh, the executive order is pretty clear uh, on that intent. And again, you can see from the uh, medical device uh, safety action plan from FDA CDRH, it's quite clear on our uh, intent uh, to have SBOMs front and center, uh, not only for pre-market review, uh, but, but also for other use cases such as in the post-market when a vulnerability uh, is released, let's say, oh, I don't know, there's a problem in a web server logging function like uh, log4j. Wouldn't it be great uh, if a manufacturer and a healthcare delivery organization could very quickly comb through its software bill of materials to see, hey, are we vulnerable uh, by understanding what software is on the inside? And uh, I think we'll be moving in that direction uh, over the coming years because it's, uh, in, my, in my view, the idea of a, a nest bomb, uh, it, it, it's, it's just sort of a no-brainer. Uh, of course, you want to know what's on the inside. And the, I think the devil is going to be in the details. For instance, there are a lot of questions on, well, what kind of formatting would an SBOM be? What kind of machine readability would it look like? Uh, how often does it need to be updated? These are important questions uh, that are being discussed now, but I think the general concept of are SBOMs important? In my view, the answer is unequivocally yes. And so on that note, I, I do want to be clear too that um, consistent with the executive order, medical device security is, is not simply an option. It's not an add-on. It's not a checkbox. The operational technology, which appears in Biden's executive order, also known as uh, OT cybersecurity, OT cybersecurity requires a deliberate set of design choices that begin at the earliest phases of risk management. Uh, and requirement specification. So well before you start designing a system, definitely before implementing and testing, that's the best place to get uh, sound cybersecurity engineering built into a device. And I think the executive order is pretty clear that this is how the federal government wants to see the various marketplaces moving so that cybersecurity is built in rather than bolted on. Moving into 2022, FDA is looking into a few new areas to further strengthen its cybersecurity posture. Dr. Fu will explain how the agency plans to do this, alluding to new guidance, strategies, and talent that will take a proactive approach to security as opposed to defensive. The biggest uh, item in 2022 is the revised draft uh, pre-market guidance on cybersecurity. Uh, which is expected out in fiscal year 2022. I expect that process of, of uh, having public comment and such to take an extremely high priority moving into the new year. So uh, that to me is, is likely to define 2022 uh, because we've learned so much since that initial pre-market guidance was drafted around 2013. Uh, going through finalization, and then in 2018, revised draft guidance uh, shortly before the pandemic. So I, I expect, again, that'll be uh, an extremely high priority. One other uh, high priority that dovetails with your earlier question about uh, things like workforce development, in the long term, and that includes 2022 and the years thereafter, I would like to see a future of medical device security that shifts from this sort of hyperventilating reaction to vulnerabilities to much more calm preparation. We, we know how to engineer medical devices to withstand modern day cybersecurity risks. It's, it's not impossible. 
Uh, it's something that even uh, undergraduates uh, are sufficiently trained in um, top cybersecurity engineering programs. So in my view, the bottleneck for the long term and in the future is a human problem. And that is the, the community, uh, and this includes manufacturers, healthcare delivery organizations, universities, they need to work on attracting fresh talent to the field. Uh, and this fresh talent is likely to draw on uh, a few different fields, uh, one called operational technology. Uh, it's the uh, sort of uh, cousin to IT. It's known as OT cybersecurity, not IT cybersecurity. Uh, how to protect sort of all the kinetic, kinetic devices of the world from medical devices, autonomous vehicles to IoT. Uh, so drawing on that and public health and biomedical engineering, I think are gonna be really key to get some fresh talent. I think it's great if we can convince uh, computer science, uh, information science students uh, to entering the field to protect the cybersecurity of medical devices. But I also think that there are a lot of opportunities being left on the table by the greater uh, community because their computer science uh, over the last few uh, decades have traditionally uh, attracted uh, people who, uh, for instance, love coding and programming, and that's great. Um, but there's also another group of people who uh, go into careers because they like helping people. And so I would like to see that the community fosters career pipelines for students who are first driven by the desire to help people and then training these people in cybersecurity engineering basics and combining it with topics like biomedical engineering, I think will lead to great innovation uh, at protecting these devices so that the patients and consumers can have confidence that their future medical devices are secure and they'll have confidence to use these advanced therapies and diagnostics. So um, those are two things I see uh, as really important in 2022 and, and moving forward into the future. Thank you for tuning in. And if you enjoyed the show, please follow us on your favorite podcast app or listen to more at governmentciomedia.com. Until next time. HealthCast, along with GovCast and CyberCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released every Tuesday and Wednesday across our shows. You can follow all of them in your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at gcio.com.